Welcome to Researching Statutes Part 1, Statutes and Their Publication. This is a tutorial by the Jerome Hall Law Library at Indiana University Maurer School of Law. This tutorial will present an overview explaining what statutes are and how they're published. What is a statute? A statute is a law passed by a legislative body. This makes it different from both the law that is found in court decisions from the judicial branch and also regulations promulgated by the administrative branch of government. Federal statutes are enacted by Congress and are signed by the president. Each state's laws are enacted by its legislature and signed by the state's governor. Pictured here is a federal statute, the Civil Rights Act of 1964. Note that local governments can also pass laws that are like statutes, but they are generally called ordinances, and they have their own unique publications and databases. We're not really going to cover them here. How are statutes published? All jurisdictions share the same basic publication process for enacted laws. It begins with something called a slip law the first official publication of a law with its public law number, and they're published individually in pamphlets or pieces of paper. Slip laws get collected and compiled in chronological order and bound together in what we call session laws. It's a collection of all the laws that were passed in that legislative session. These are static documents they are not changed even when the law later gets amended or repealed or added on to. These documents are intended for historical records. After the session laws, statutes get rearranged into something called a code. Codes are helpful research tools because of this hierarchical subject arrangement of the statutes that they create. Instead of chronological order, which is very difficult to navigate through, we have a topic-based order so that you can find all the laws on public health together and all the laws on crimes together and all the laws on taxes together. The other thing about codes is that they're continuously updated with changes to the statutory language. They are meant to reflect the law as it is now rather than be a historical record of what was enacted in the past. Let's take a closer look at each of these publication formats. So I said a moment ago, a slip law is the first official form in which a law is published. It's the text of a law as passed, and it's a single law published on its own in pamphlet form, or some are short enough that they're even just a single piece of paper. When a bill is enacted into law, it's assigned a unique public law number. Although the format of the public law numbers does vary in different jurisdictions, it's pretty common for the number to indicate the year or session of the legislature, as well as the sequential number of the law itself. So for example, a federal public law number consists of two numbers separated by a hyphen. The first number indicates the Congress in which the law was passed. So in this instance, the 112th Congress. And the second number represents the numerical order in which the law was passed during that Congress. This one is the 253rd law passed by the 112th Congress. Session laws are all the slip laws coming out of a single legislative session, compiled in chronological order and put together as the laws of that session. And of course, they exist at both the federal and state levels. It's important to note that session laws are in chronological order rather than arranged into any kind of subject-based hierarchy. What this means is that you may have a welfare law immediately followed by a criminal reform law because that's what the legislature passed next, and then followed by a law about highways or taxes. There's also no comprehensive subject index to the session laws. They're just chronological order. This makes them difficult to use for research purposes. Another thing that makes them difficult to use if you want to know what the law is today is that session laws are not modified to reflect later amendments. So if language gets changed or added or deleted, 
No one goes back to the session laws and updates them. That's not the point of session laws. Their purpose is to be a static historical record of the language as it was passed however many years ago. And last, the session laws contain all the enacted legislation in a jurisdiction. So all the public laws, private laws, resolutions, anything like that. And then if a law gets repealed, it doesn't get removed from the session laws. It stays there. Again, their purpose is to be a historical record and have the accurate text when it was enacted. Session laws often come in two versions, an official version, typically published by the government or maybe through a contract with a commercial publisher, and then unofficial versions, which the commercial publishers put out. And these are not sanctioned by the government, but are generally considered highly accurate. Um, and this is true both in print and online. You're going to find multiple versions of the session laws. The official version of the federal session laws is called the United States Statutes at Large. They are abbreviated STAT in citations, and the first number of a statutes at large citation indicates the volume number, and the second number indicates the page number of that volume where the text of that statute begins. So 122 stat 465 means volume 122 of the statutes at large on page 465. Pictured here are several volumes of the statutes at large. You might notice that volume 122 is split across two books. This is a little confusing since we often call an individual book a volume, but here the volume number is used for the entire second session of the 110th Congress, which occurred in 2008. The amount of legislation enacted during that session was too much to bind in a single book, so the publisher splits it into volume 122 part 1 and volume 122 part 2. Each state also has its own session laws publication, and these titles can vary from state to state. As you see here, Indiana calls their session laws either the laws of the state of Indiana or more commonly, Indiana Acts. Michigan calls it the Acts of the Legislature, and California calls it Statutes of California. It doesn't matter, they're all the same idea. You can always use your blue book in table T1.3 to identify the names of whatever state's session laws. That table, T1.3, lists the names of the publications in each of the states. It's very handy for that. The next step after session laws is the statutory code. Statutory codes are better for most research tasks. Their purpose is to group together laws on similar subjects and to provide the current language of the law neither of which session laws do. In general, a code is a subject organization of all the general and permanent laws of a jurisdiction. Enacted laws are codified, which means they are arranged by subject instead of chronology. I've said this several times now. I'm going to really drive that point home. New laws are slotted into the appropriate part of the subject hierarchy. In some cases, pieces of new statutes will even be placed in different parts of the code because they address different subjects. The Affordable Care Act is a good example of this. Some pieces of the ACA went into the code title on taxes, while others went into public health and welfare, as well as labor. And the subject-based organization makes research much easier and more effective so that I can go and find all the laws that apply to labor or all the laws that apply to taxes. In addition, statutory codes are kept current as laws are amended so that they reflect the current language of the law, which is generally what we want to use. So what about this general permanent laws part of this statement? Codes include only laws of a general and permanent nature, which means they do not include private laws or laws that are in effect for a limited time, such as budget laws, appropriations laws, or laws that expire very quickly, um, emergency measures. And just for a minute, back to private laws, which I mentioned, private laws affect only a limited number of people. They often have to do with immigration 
or address some kind of harm done to an individual by the government. As a bonus, codes also typically include constitutions and court rules. As we saw with session laws, there are both official and unofficial editions of statutory codes. And again, the official is the one published by the government, and these are typically unannotated, the official government published codes. The unofficial versions are commercially produced and they contain annotations. An annotated code is a commercially published version of the code which contains not only the text of the code, but is supplemented with editorial enhancements that will aid you in your research. Things like citations to and summaries of judicial decisions which have interpreted the code section that you're looking at. Citations to administrative regulations and attorney general opinions that relate to this code section. And research references to secondary sources like legal encyclopedias and law reviews and practice materials. All of these are going to be in an annotated code. And this makes annotated codes really useful for research. Jurisdictions can have multiple versions of their unofficial codes. And you see some of these listed here. Let's look at these in a little more detail. So the US code is the official version of the federal code. And it contains all the federal statutes that are currently in effect and are of a general and permanent nature. It was first published in 1926 and a new edition comes out supposedly every six years, though that sometimes runs behind. And then annual cumulative supplements are published in between those editions to keep it up to date. Here are the two unofficial but annotated versions of the federal code, the United States Code Annotated and the United States Code Service. One is from Thompson West and the other is from LexisNexis. Both of these are updated more quickly than the US Code. This shows you the organization of the US Code into 54 what are called titles or broad subject categories. Each of these titles is further subdivided into many subtopics, and the most specific of those is going to be called a section. You can see this reflected in the way we cite the US Code. This citation is to 42 US Code section 8201 from the 2018 edition. Here you can see 42 for the title, US Code, the section symbol, the section number, and then the date of the edition. And if you were using one of the supplements, one of the annual supplements from 2019 or 2020, you would note that in with your date. States can have uh, numerous code versions as well, an official one in most states published by the government, and then unofficial and annotated codes in the states as well. Indiana has all three. You see here the official version, the Indiana Code. The Burns Indiana Statutes Annotated from LexisNexis and West's Annotated Indiana Code from Thompson West. States organize their codes in different ways, um, though all have the sense of a hierarchy of subjects. So a top level and then in between levels and then a most specific level and they can call those levels different things. You see here South Carolina uses title, article, chapter, and section, which is also what Indiana uses, but you can see that New Mexico and Texas call theirs something a little bit different. But they are all organized by topic instead of chron chronology to make research easier and more accurate. Sometimes you actually need to find out what the law said in the past as opposed to the current version of the law. And this is where superseded codes come in handy. What we do is we save the current version of the code each year and set it aside. This is done digitally as well so that we can go back and look at what the code said in the past. This can come up, for example, if you have a client that committed a crime two years ago, you'll want to know how that crime was defined two years ago and what the punishment was then. A situation that I've dealt with in my work was someone who wanted to buy a firearm but had a criminal record from 1978 for vagrancy. 
if that 1978 vagrancy charge was a felony, they would not be allowed to buy a firearm, but if it was a misdemeanor, they would be allowed. So we had to go back to the 1978 criminal code to determine what the charge of vagrancy carried. So you should now have a basic understanding of how statutes progress from slip laws to session laws to statutory codes. You should understand the difference between session laws and statutory codes. I've said it about five times now, I'm sure you're sick of it. Also that there's a difference between official and unofficial and annotated and unannotated codes. I hope you have a sense of the basic structure of the US code and that the state codes structure there's in a variety of ways. And finally, what superseded codes are used for. This concludes Researching Statutes Part 1. You should now go on to the next tutorial, Researching Statutes Part 2. If you have any questions, the reference librarians at the Jerome Hall Law Library are happy to help.